Reading French Cinema, The First Wave, 1915-1929 through 1929, by Richard Abel. Introduction. To paraphrase, to paraphrase Jean Epstein, the book that one writes is never the book that one initially conceives. A book that presumes to be a history, especially both less and more. Less than one had hoped for in all sorts of ways in the consistency and comprehensiveness of its design in the thoroughness of its investigation of sources, in the articulation of its findings, in the balance of its mediation between past, present, and future, but also more. For the misconceptions corrected, one's own as well as others, the new questions posed, the conceptual models considered, the discoveries made in progress, and the ways found to speak to the, or the way and the ways found to speak them the process of writing a history in fact can be so engrossing stimulating and open-ended that to close it off seems little more than arbitrary and expedient any project that aims to reconstruct the past of course is fraught with difficulties if we tend to iron out ambiguities in the light of more recent developments and the questions raised by them as john berger has noted it is imperative that we recognize the interest and patterns of thinking that guide our work here Shoshana Fellman's pedagogical questions may be helpful. Quote, what is the, quote, navel, end quote, of my own theoretical dream of understanding? Question mark. What is, speci- what is the specificity of my own incomprehension? Question mark. What is the riddle which I, in effect, here pose under the guise of knowledge? Question mark. Such questions may help us, or such questions may keep us from repeating the fable of a history already agreed upon, or from accepting the illusory idealism of an absolute knowledge and the mastery it bestows, as well as us to counter the conclusion that all things deeply searched merely become confusing. The project for this book had its origin in the summer of 1976. A sabbatical leave from Drake University permitted me to travel to Paris where I could continue a study begun three years earlier of French films and critical writings from the 1920s. At the Cinématique Francais, Marie Epstein, with the approval of the late Henri Lagos and Mary Merson, Generally, generously agreed to let me examine closely and repeatedly a number of a large number of French films, especially those of her brother Jean Epstein, and are on an old hand cranked editing machine in one of the dark, cluttered offices of on Rue Cousel. Within a month, I discovered that my stay chance to coincide with an extensive retrospective of early French films, quote, 80 years of French cinema, part two, end quote, mounted with the then usual lack of publicity by the Cinematique Francais from late July to the middle of September for three to five hours five afternoons a week with the legendary delays and substitutions of film prints, I perched uncomfortably on what passed for cushions on or in the black walled petite salle at Shalott and madly took notes as film after film unreeled in the darkness and silence. The idea of writing a history of the French cinema of the 1920s already tempted me, but I preferred first to do a number of studies of individual filmmakers and film texts before tackling such an immense project. Uh, 
Gradually, after more and more editing machine sessions and screenings, conversations with Stuart Liebman, then a graduate student at New York University, Dugald Williamson, then a graduate student at Griffith University in Australia, and Peter Cowie, Tantivy Press, made me realize the unique opportunity at hand. By the time I returned to the United States in December 1976, I was committed to an historical project that would occupy over five years of research and writing. During the course of that writing, I came to see that the project actually covered more than a decade and was marked off by two major disruptions. The halt in French film production from 1914 to 1915 that resulted from the outbreak of World War I and the slowdown that came from the industry's belated acceptance of the, quote, sound film revolution, end quote, in 1929. I also realized that to more clearly differentiate between the commercial and avant-garde cinema during this 15-year period, I needed to distribute the work into two major sections. The first would focus on the dominant film industry and the commercial feature films that were the staple of its production. The second would focus on the alternate cinema network which developed in parallel to the industry and on the narrative and non-narrative avant-garde films that were determined in part by that network. In effect, this project gradually has grown into a major reassessment and, if I may presume, a much needed, quote, revisionist, end quote, history of the French cinema during the period 1915 to 1929. The absence of prior studies, with the exception of George Sadol's mammoth yet uneven history General du cinema, six volumes, as well as Jean Mitry's slightly less imposing History du Cinema, now five volumes, demanded that I give more space than originally planned to the changing material conditions and policies of the French film industry and to the previously unexamined generic nature of its output of commercial feature films. Furthermore, the general lack of sustained close analysis of the narrative avant-garde films, both in French and English, led me to sacrifice not only the short non-narrative avant-garde works, many of which have received a good deal of attention in the United States, but also the usual auteur-based study of those films. Instead, I decided to position the theory and practice of the narrative avant-garde within the context of the conventions of narrative film discourse then operating in the French as well as the American cinema. This somewhat original working definition then provided the framework for a series of individual textual studies of the narrative avant-garde's exploration of the cinema systems of signification, the means to what they saw as a new aesthetic practice. Some years ago, Jean Mitry defined a proper history of the cinema as simultaneously a history of its industry, its technologies, its systems of expression, or more precisely, signification and its aesthetic structures, all bound together by the forces of the economic, socio or psychosocial and cultural order. Writing such an inclusive history is perhaps an impossible task. As one French film historian confessed recently, quote, it is already too late to write the history of the silent cinema, end quote. In my case, the received level of knowledge about the early French cinema in English, as well as the constraints of time, access to sources, intellectual acumen, and personal interest have led me to emphasize certain subjects and lines of inquiry at the expense of others. 
Still, the purpose of this history is is multiple. First of all, for English-speaking viewers, it provides a good deal of, quote, new information, end quote, about this neglected period of French film history. That information includes not only data on specific films and filmmakers, on industry policies and practices, on institutional as well as individual relations, on ideological and aesthetic constructs, but also resource references as a means of stimulating further inquiry. It also singles out particular areas of historical development for special attention, either because of a lack in prior histories and critical studies, or because of serious misconceptions and misrepresentations. That is why so much space is given over to the industry and its more commercial products and why even more is given to the narrative avant-garde practice. Finally, it continuously raises questions of historical accuracy, conceptual formulation, and textual reading and interpretation in an attempt to offer directions for further research on the sprinch cinema of the silent period. May at least some of this work meet the challenge thrown down. In another context by Walter Benjamin, block quote, a writer who does not teach other writers teaches nobody. The crucial point, therefore, is that a writer's production must have the character of a model. It must be able to instruct other writers in their production and, secondly, it must be able to place an, an improved apparatus at their disposal. This apparatus will be the better the more consumers it brings in contact with the production process. In short, the more readers or spectators it turns into collaborators. End of block quote. The American researcher interested in the Frick cinema of the 1910s and 1920s faces a number of obstacles. Access to existing films and written sources is severely limited because the best archives are in Europe. The largest repository of French silent films is the product of Henry Lagoise's extraordinary lifelong passion for film collecting. The Cinématique Francais in Paris, until recently, however, the Cinématique had shown little interest in, nor could it probably afford, providing viewing facilities for historians and critics, except on, a, on an irregular, rather personal basis. Specific films had to be, quote, caught, end quote, in their infrequent public screenings at Chalet, Chalat or Beauberg, and previously at Rue de Lome. Now that the Cinematique's relationships with the French government and with the state archive to film, archives to film at Bois d'Arcy have stabilized and become more clear, the attitude has begun to change. Smaller collections of French silent films are housed at Bois d'Arcy, at the Royal Film Archive of Belgium in Brussels, at the National Film Archive in London, and at the Cinematique du Toulouse. Except for the latter, all provide, at some cost, excellent viewing facilities for visiting researchers. The most important libraries for written sources pertaining to the period are also located in Paris. The Bibli Bibliothèque de l'Arsenal, the Bibliothèque de Hec, the Bibliothèque Nationale, and the Bibliothèque de la Cinématique Française just recently opened for the first time to the public. Another valuable collection is housed at the Cinematique de Toulouse. For a list of sources consulted 
for this history, see the appended bibliography, especially the section on film journals. In the United States, the most important collection of film, the most important collection of French silent films is the, or I'll read it back. In the United States, the most important collection of French silent films is at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. During the past few years, the museum has been adding excellent prints of 1920s French films to its archives and beginning in January 1983, it included all these as well as prints from other archives in an extensive retrospective of the French cinema. Smaller collections of French silent films are housed at the George Eastman House in Rochester, at Anthology Film Archives in New York, at the Library of Congress in Washington, at the UCLA Film Archives in Los Angeles, and at the State Historical Society of Wisconsin in Madison. Along with the Museum of Modern Art, all provide superb viewing facilities for researchers. Written sources pertaining to the period are less easy to come by. The best collection of material related to the narrative and non-narrative avant-garde films is housed at the Museum of Modern Art while those related to the commercial film industry can be found at the New York Public Library, the Library of Congress, and the University of Southern California. For researchers seriously interested in the French cinema of the 1910s and 1920s, consequently, it is almost imperative to arrange to study in Europe. If access to sources presents a problem, the number and condition of existing film prints presents one even more severe. No one seems to know exactly how many of the several thousand films, excluding newsreels, educational films, and other short works produced in France from 1915 to 1929, still exist and in what condition. Raymond Board recently reported that his queries to some 30 film archives around the world had turned up only 222 titles of the approximately 1,400 French films produced just between 1910 and 1929. Although most of the films of the narrative avant-garde were diverted from the industry's economic cycle of production, exhibition, and destruction, through the action of cine clubs, specialized cinemas, and private collectors, the more commercial products usually had less chance of survival. A good number of important films seem irretrievably lost. For example, Boroncelli's Ram Ramacho, 1919, Herville's Paris, 1924, Grey Millions, Tour à Large, 1927, Renoir's uh, Marquita, 1927, Fader's Therese Raquin, 1928, Bernard's Terra Canova, 1930. Others, though listed as surviving, actually exist in incomplete or condensed versions e.g. several of Antoine's films for a Pathé Consortium, several of Poirier's, or Poirier's films for Gamat Dulac, uh, Dulac's La Mort de Soul, 1922, Roussel's Les Apremes, 1923, Violet's Imperialis, 1924, and La Terre, Promise, 1925, Louis Marat's La Cité, For Jurier, 1924, Perrette's Madame Sans Genet, 1925, Volkov's Michelle Strogoff, 1926, Bernard's Jordache's, 1927, and 
This list does not even consider the popular serials, comic shorts, and other lesser films. Despite the special attention paid to them, several of the narrative avant-garde films are also lost or survive in less than incomplete versions, e.g. Deluxe La Fête Espanol, 1920, Del Lux La, Sil- La Silence, 1920, Faders Lemich, 1926, and Epstein's Satet 1930. Added to this destruction and dismemberment is the loss of two features considered essential to the film's exhibition. The first to be lost were the musical arrangements and special scores for large orchestras, organs, or small chamber groups, which accompanied the film screenings. These were particularly important to the films of Marcel. Le Harbier to Bernard's Le Miracle, The Loops, 1924, to Mar- Maradon's Salam Beau, 1925, to Epstein's La Chute de la Maison Usher, 1928, and to others as well. Only recently has any attention been given to this specialized music, and very few scores have yet been found. Perhaps the most important, quote, reconstruction, end quote, to come out of this effort has been Claire's Ant, 1924, meticulously timed to synchronize with Eric Satie's music. The second feature to to disappear was color. Most French films of the period were tinted in a half dozen different colors according to a conventional set of codes. Blue for night scenes and seascapes, mauve for early evening scenes, light green for daylight exteriors, amber for interiors, red for passionate scenes or those lit by fire. Some were even toned in the dark areas of the frame as well as tinted in the light areas, producing a relatively refined two-color process. In the scenes of horror, for instance, the light areas were tinted red while the dark areas were toned green. In Gantz's Napoleon, 1927, the general's reaction to the burning of the French fleet off Toulon was described in a close shot of his face tinted orange red against a background toned deep blue. Certain pathé films, e.g. from La Sultan de la Mar, 1919 to Casanova, 1927, were even printed in a complicated stencil process that could accommodate three or four different colors within a single frame. Tragically, Very few film prints survive with their original color intact, and it is quite expensive to reproduce it. I myself have seen only a half dozen or so original prints. Gantz's Jacques, 1919, Pactal's Travel, 1919 through 1920, La Herbier's El Dorado, 1921, Poirier's Jocelyn, 1922, La Samtie, La Dame de Mansoru, 1923, Epstein's Pasteur, 1922, and Ma Pratt, 1926, and a brief fragment of Balkov's Casanova, 1927. The loss of these features changes the works drastically. The parallel to Greek and Roman statues is both presumptuous and apt. Furthermore, it lessens the impact of those few films that were exhibited in Sapia, e.g. Claire's Un Chapeau de Pelle de Italie, 1928, and in stark black and white, e.g. Fader's Therese Raquin, 1928, Dreyer's 
La Passion de Jeanne d'Arc, 1928, in Epstein, Epstein's La Chute de la Mission Assure, 1928, in Finis Terre, 1929, as well as those that may have included scored moments of silence. Consequently, writing a history of the French cinema of the 1910s and 1920s is a treacherous operation, somewhat like constructing a work of landscape art over partially visible terrain. Not only is one sometimes cut off from the quote primary end quote or the quote primary evidence end quote, the individual film text and forced to rely on written documents for description and analysis, but one can rarely view even those films that survive under conditions of their original projection and as frequently as one would wish. Nearly all of the films I have selected for extended analysis are those I have been able to study closely on a viewing machine or view several times projected on a screen. The section on the narrative avant-garde is predict is predicated exclusively on the shot by shot descriptions that this kind of study allows. As scrupulous as it may seem, such a method inevitably produces gaps and misrepresentations. I have tried to keep these to a minimum and Whenever discrepancies between archive prints have cropped up, I have taken note of them. January 1983. And that was the introduction to Frick Cinema, The First Wave, 1915 through 1929 by Richard Abel, published by Princeton University Press.